Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, we're going to get started. I want to welcome everybody here today to the first annual uh, State of Public Safety Address from the District Attorney's Office here in Sacramento. And so as we begin, I would like to go ahead and recognize some of our elected officials and dignitaries. Um, I do want to start with those um, that are on our federal level. And so if you are a executive um, or a representative from an elected official on the federal level, um, please stand up and be recognized. I know that we also have some representatives from um, our state legislature, and so for those individuals that are here from either the Assembly or the Senate or their representatives, uh, please stand up to be recognized. Thank you. We also have a, a number of elected officials, uh, both uh, from mayoral offices, city councils, uh, from our awesome SMUD board as well. And for those individuals that are here um, from those elected offices, please stand up to be recognized along with other local elected officials. Thank you. And definitely, um, last but not least, I do want to recognize um, our law enforcement partners, especially those that um, serve every day on the front line. And if you are a law enforcement officer or an executive representative, please stand up. And I almost forgot. And if I did, I would be in trouble because they control my budget. <laughs> you know, we have several um, executives from the county and also from the Board of Supervisor, and I would be remiss if I did not recognize them at this moment. So please stand up. Thank you. Thank you for coming here today. You know, as we look back on 2023, um, there are several principles and really themes that stand out. Those principles and themes revolve around the idea of protecting people, connecting communities, and preserving promises. And with those themes in mind, I would like to share with you a, a little video presentation about what we have accomplished together in the last 12 months.
We are gathered here today to announce the arrests and the prosecution of a sexual predator that terrorized our community. Sacramento DA's office a new domestic violence app, a tool that allows victims and survivors of domestic violence to be able to get the resources they need. The primary mandate of the district attorney is to ensure public safety and the equal administration of justice for all. I can tell you that sunrise is coming, that the sunrise is coming soon enough and it will shine its beautiful rays of light upon our city of trees. mentioned some of the themes that we've focused on over the last year and that we will focus on this year revolved around the principles of protecting people, connecting communities, and preserving promises. So in regards to protecting people, I'd like to introduce a very special guest um, that is going to be introduced by Assistant Chief Deputy District Attorney Rochelle Beersley, who's going to introduce a very special guest that embodies our mission of protecting people. So, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Umberto Ariola and his family have operated a lawn care service in Sacramento for decades. Uh, Mr. Ariola is known to be a very generous employer, often helping his employees out financially whenever they had any trouble. Unfortunately for Mr. Ariola, some of his employees became disgruntled. Two individuals in particular, the Calderon brothers, planned to kidnap him and demand a ransom. Early one January morning in 2003, Mr. Ariola arrived at his office, the defendants were waiting, armed with guns and disguised in ski masks. They began pistol whipping Mr. Ariola, he fell to the ground, one, defended, one defendant pointed his gun at him and attempted to fire his weapon. Luckily, that gun jammed. They then bound him with tape including taping his eyes shut and threw him in the trunk of her car. They drove him to an abandoned farmhouse and began demanding a $500,000 ransom or they would kill him and his entire family. After some time, the defendants left and Mr. Ariola made the brave decision to chew out of his tape bound hands. He finally was able to do so and he took his broken body to the nearest street where a passerby rescued him. The defendants were ar eventually arrested by the police department. And at the trial, Mr. Ariola testified bravely against those that committed this atrocity against him. The defendants were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. However, 
due, a, due to a change in the law. One of the defendants, the one actually who pointed his gun at Mr. Ariola, he was just shy of his 18th birthday at the time he committed this offense. So he was resentenced to 25 years to life. Because of that, he has had several hearings in front of the parole board to get out. The Ariola family has attended each and every hearing and has been forced to relive this horrible, horrible event over and over again. The last hearing took place just this month. And I'll tell you, the only reason why that defendant is still in custody is because of the brave remarks by Mr. Ariola and his daughter. Our office was also there with the Ariola family because we are committed, as Tin said, to protecting people. Mr. Ariola, would you like to say a couple words? Good morning, I wanna thank uh, Richelle, the DA, and uh, Tatiana. Um, but what happened that day, and uh, these people that uh, did this to me, um, that, I mean, in the last 15 years, we, I have, uh, this is gonna be the four, the four hearing that, uh, that I'm been. And I wanna thank you, Rochelle, because she always been with me and the four, the four times she uh, called me, called me like two months before, she emailed me, she always there for me. Um, I, she makes me feel like a family. I mean, she always, she always there, and she is here. And um, I want to, I want to thank thanks the system. Before uh, I hear about the the, uh, the district attorney system, it is like uh, I didn't know much about it. Now, with her, it's like uh, amazing. It's something that. Uh, Great, and I wanna just thank, thanks everybody uh, who's helped uh, and all that. Um, so I got to say. Thank you. Every time we pick up a file, every time we walk into a courtroom, every time we stand in front of a jury, we make a promise, a promise that we will never leave the side of a victim and a survivor of crime. And it's a promise that we keep. And so this is a beautiful example of the oath that we take and the promise that we make to protect people. So with that, I want to focus on the second principle and theme, which is connecting communities. And in regards to connecting with communities, because it's just not being in the courtroom, but it's also being in the community. And when it comes to being in the community, I would like to ask supervising criminalist Crystal Suchland and Jonathan Sharone from our crime lab to come up here and to introduce two amazing speakers and guests that have done a tremendous amount of work in regards to connecting communities. Thank you. Good morning. The fentanyl epidemic has wreaked havoc nationwide, and we've certainly felt that here in Sacramento. Since, no, since January of 2021, more than 600 people have died of fentanyl, and that is just in our county alone. Those numbers are expect, expected to increase in the future as well. Several brave people have stood up to lead the charge against this drug. Angela Webb, founder and CEO of Arrival Life California, has been an active proponent of fentanyl awareness. Laura Didier, 
was personally affected by tragedy with the loss of her son, Zach, to a fentanyl poisoning. Since then, Laura has been a strong advocate and a voice for the voiceless. It is this work that has truly made a difference in helping create a safer community. The Sacramento County District Attorney's Office is a proud partner for these brave voices to help connect communities. We would now like to invite Angela and Laura to share a few words. Hi everyone, I trust you can hear me okay. Um, I am Laura Didier and just over three years ago on December 27th of 2020, my youngest child of three, 17 years old at the time, was found dead in his bedroom with no apparent reason why. Uh, through the investigation, uh, he, he passed in Placer County. We were well supported there as well um, to bring justice for my son. He had no drugs in his room, nor did he have a history of substance use issues. He was a straight A student, an athlete, a performer, a tremendous son and brother. But we were able to piece together what had happened to him on that fateful Christmas break during COVID when he made an out of character choice to try what was being marketed on social media as a prescription pill. That cho choice proved fatal because he was not told that that Percocet was actually a counterfeit made with a fa fatal amount of fentanyl. At the time I lost my son in 2020, I had no awareness of this issue. These pills were new to our area. There was no awareness. And I had to make a decision of where to go, how to heal, how to turn tragedy into something positive. And I am tremendously grateful to the partners who have been with me through this journey. Um, Morgan Geyer in Placer County has been tremendous, as well as Tin Ho and his predecessor, Anne Marie Schubert. What is so remarkable is that in addition to being officers of the court, they see this mission of educating families in our community as paramount. And in doing my uh, advocacy work, I, I work with a nonprofit now called Song for Charlie. You can go and find tremendous resources there. We partnered with the DA's office and other agencies in Sacramento County to launch One Pill Can Kill Zach, not long after losing Zach. I don't know where I would be, honestly, if I didn't feel supported by the community, if I didn't feel like my son's story mattered, if I didn't have wonderful partners like Angela Webb that you're gonna hear from next. I've spoken with Angela, side by side with Angela and with Tin Ho, countless schools and town halls because their hearts are in this work with me. I miss my son. The world keeps moving, but he'll always be 17. And I'm grateful that Sacramento has embraced him as a son of theirs too. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of our community. It is a pleasure of mine to be able to celebrate the incredible strides we have made in our community by connection. Good morning, my name is Angela Webb. I'm the founder and CEO of Arrive Alive California, a Sacramento-based nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing dynamic, youth-focused prevention education to our schools. For years, we've had the privilege of partnering with Sacramento County District Attorney's Office. And last year, early on, I had the, the meeting with DA Ten Ho to talk about our co ongoing collaboration and possibly even expanding into this epidemic called fentanyl awareness. Ten Ho responded positively, expressing not just support, but a vision to reach more, connect more, in order to save more lives. With the support of the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office, the Sacramento County Crime Lab, Sacramento County Board of Supervisors, Department of Health Services, and California Highway Patrol, we created a groundbreaking educational program about fentanyl, the involving, evolving drug landscape that Sacramento is experiencing and impaired driving, not just with alcohol involved, 
DUIs, but all substances involving impaired driving. This is a collaboration that has never been seen before. The program's success led to expansion to include parent meetings, town halls, and educators' community workshops. The One Pill Can Kill Sacramento, the future-focused fentanyl awareness program and the Real DUI Court in Schools program made Sacramento County the model for youth prevention and dynamic uh, evolution. And this is throughout the entire state of California. Sharing resources and knowledge about and with other organizations is not just a noble pursuit, but it is a fundamental necessity to elevate the well-being of our community, ensuring that every member has the tools to, they need to not just survive, but to thrive. By joining hands, we amplify our impact, turning shared aspirations into tangible re realities. Collaboration truly, truly is the heartbeat of a flourishing community. Our 2000 23 achievements are remarkable. For over a decade, we have averaged reaching about 25,000 youth in our community. However, in 2023, I am so proud to say, under Ten Ho's leadership, we reached 108,545 <laughs> youth, parents, and members of our community. We brought this information and it was life-saving information on multiple topics. These achievements and numbers not only represent impact data collection that we have, but it is potentially the lot number of lives that we have saved. Thank you to our District Attorney Ten Ho for your dedication to unity and collaborative efforts. Under your leaderships, we have experienced profound impact and transformative power of a com connected community. This is the catalyst of positive change. And now let us all continue with his vision to reach more, connect more, in order to share and save more lives. Thank you. You know, when we talk about turning tragedy into triumph, when we talk about turning pain into power, you know, th these two amazing women here, Angela Webb and Laura Didier, They've done just that. Reaching over 100,000 students, parents, and community members is an amazing feat, and that saves lives. But I also have to recognize for a moment and emphasize that we could not have done that without the support from our Board of Supervisor, from Supervisor Patrick Kennedy, Sue Frost, Rich Desmond, Phil Cerna, and Pat Hume. That was incredibly important to have their support to be able to do this. And the idea is to expand this now, expand it from high school to junior high, expand it to go out into a juvenile hall, to expand that out to um, ethnic communities in their temples, um, in their synagogues, in their community centers, and that is connecting communities. But we're all more than about just protecting people and connecting communities. We also want to make sure that we are preserving our promises. And with that, I'd like to bring up Supervising District Attorney Sonia Martinez Satchel to introduce our next guest. Good morning. In the last seven years, Sacramento's unhoused population has exploded by over 250 percent and our community has definitely felt the impact. In response to our request last year for Sacramentans to fill out a survey, residents responded in large amounts. They reported large encampments terrorizing their neighborhoods for years. Thousands of survey takers told us the same thing, that they could not walk around their neighborhoods freely. They were concerned about assault, vandalism, seeing human trafficking and drug abuse on a daily basis. Business owners reported severe decline in their businesses because patrons were afraid to come in. Their burglaries were pushing their costs to the brink, making them consider whether or not to close their businesses. One such business owner is Lee Archie. He has owned a business for almost a decade and will tell us how his livelihood has been negatively impacted by this crisis. Now, even before District Attorney Tin Ho was elected, he promised to work hard to focus on alleviating this crisis. 
Because District Attorney Ho believes in preserving promises since taking office, he has been an advocate for this, for these victims and this crisis. Mr. Archie. Hello, everyone. My name is Lee Archie, and I'm actually, the, my family and I are the owner of 601 First Avenue, which is a commercial property here in Sacramento. Um, I uh, was very much impacted by the homeless uh, there at 601. They actually had a camp there right across the street from us, and it was, had four fires in the fish shellfish company there in uh, Sacramento that occurred in three years. A uh, number of incidents, uh, drugs, uh, we've seen prostitution, uh, vandalism. In my particular case, I've had numerous break-ins over the years um, at the tune of just, at a point it was almost daily where they would break in. Um, and we would deal with that on a daily basis. And I was actually, we felt just almost helpless um, until we, uh, we were almost at the point to where we had no clue what our next option was. And because it was a daily thing, every day, all day. And until the district attorney office we got, they got in touch with them, and because we were at that point, we didn't have no option. And they single-handedly made a difference. They actually made a difference. We finally, when it was all said and done, uh, they, we finally had a relief. And it was, uh, uh, we had shootings where the homeless had camps, had set up camps there in front of our, our business we didn't have uh, the street was closed and the kids was coming from school one afternoon and the gunshot had there was three gunshots fired and the kids actually ran into my yard for cover and that was the most disheartening thing I've ever seen they was actually running for shelter and it come from the homeless tent there uh, and then they moved them out after the fire the last fire there at the uh, shellfish company on six o at, at on First Avenue, they finally moved them out of the homeless camp and put them in the middle of the street, right there in front of my business, which totally shut my business down. And we're just a small family-run business, and again, we just didn't have an option. We called in daily, three one one, and nothing was done. But. Uh, uh, it, it was a thing where we just uh, really made a difference. And through taxes, high taxes, and all the other, it's just almost like we had our hands tied behind us. But thanks again to District Attorney Hope and their staff that they have truly made a difference. And right now we are we're on the mend. Thank you. Someone once said, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service to others. Last year, I stood up and raised my right hand to take an oath to serve this community, to serve this community with commitment and integrity. Over that last year, we have done so through making sure that we protect people, connect communities, and preserve our promises. The speakers that you heard from today represent those accomplishments over the last year, but there are other accomplishments from last year and many more to come this year. When it comes to protecting people, last year we used investigative genetic genealogy in order to identify a serial rapist and bring him back to California to stand justice. 
When it comes to protecting people, we prosecuted successfully a no-body homicide case for the first time in over 20 years in Sacramento County, convicting two individuals for a revenge killing. When it comes to protecting people, we work with the Sheriff's Department and the Internet Crimes Against Children to take sexual predators off the streets. When it comes to protecting people, we collaborate with a coalition working on the Partnership for Public Safety, for the Public Safety Partnership, the PSP Federal Program, where we collaborate with Chief Kathy Lester from the Sacramento Police Department and U.S. Attorney Phil Talbert on our federal partners. And as a result of that partnership, to reduce violent crime, we saw a significant and drastic reduction in violent crime last year. For example, we saw a 40% reduction in homicides in the city of Sacramento last year. We saw a reduction in violent crimes by nearly 20% due to this partnership. When we talk about protecting people, we talk about our community prosecution team, a robust program that we have, for example, in Rancho Cordova, where we partner with Rancho Cordova Police Chief Tamayo and the council out there in order to really handle quality of life crimes. And this year, we actually expanded our community prosecution team to the city of Elk Grove. And we would not have been able to do so without the leadership and help of Elk Grove Mayor Bobby Singh Allen, council members Darren Sewin, Sergio Robles, Rod Brew, and Kevin Spies, and our wonderful police chiefs there along with Sky River Casino. But when we talk about our expansion to Elk Grove and community prosecution, I'll give you one example, our community prosecutor, Anthony Ortiz. There was a long simmering neighborhood dispute that had been going on for nearly a decade. And our community prosecutor was able to stand in and be able to resolve that issue that had been simmering and boil over. Now that particular situation, it's not gonna make the headlines necessarily in the newspaper or be on the five o'clock news, but you know what, it makes a difference to the people in that community, in that neighborhood, in that city. When we're talking about protecting people, recently, my office charged two separate individuals with murder regarding the selling of fentanyl that caused the death of two people. We did that in collaboration with the Folsom Police Department. But there's more to do, and there's more to come this year. You know, as criminalists, supervising criminalists Suchlin mentioned, there's been nearly 600 fentanyl deaths in Sacramento County in the last three years. That's all, more than all the gun-related homicides. And as a result of that, what we are doing with our U.S. Attorney Phil Talbert, with our police chief and our other local partners, what we are doing is going to be creating a rapid fentanyl response team in the next few months here, where they're gonna go out to crime scenes, they're gonna go out and investigate post um, incidents, where we are going to find these peddlers of poison and hold them responsible for murder. But we're gonna do more. You know, we talk about our organized retail theft problem. You know. The federal, the National Retailers Federation noted that Sacramento was seventh in the country when it came to retail theft. You know, I recently spoke with one of the big retailers, the national retailers, and he told me that one of their stores here in Sacramento actually saw a 260% increase in retail theft in one year. A 260% increase. And so with that in mind, we started the organized retail theft unit where we have a full-time prosecutor and a full-time investigator that will be handling the case from beginning to end. And in just a few weeks, we have already charged 35 individuals related to this crime. But we are doing more. One of the things that we're working on right now in this coming year is we're gonna work with our local assembly member, Stephanie Wynn, to pass a legislation to close a loophole that allows people who have committed attempted murder from completely walking free after only doing a few classes and a few counseling sessions. What we are going to be doing is making sure that the voices of victims are heard. And with that in mind, we are going to be doing more to protect people. But it's more than just that. Over the last year, we've also connected communities as well. 
in order to reconnect with the community, we started the community council at the Sacramento DA's office. And I want to talk about this for a moment because we did so in a very unique and new way. We just didn't create a community council, but we created a series of smaller committees from diverse communities, whether it was the African American, the Asian, the Latino, the labor, the business community, right? The faith-based community, the education community, the Native American community. And what we are doing is each of those committees have certain issues that affect their community. And they will vote an individual from their committee to sit on the greater council that meets with me on a regular basis. And through meeting with that community council, some of the issues that have come up, for example, the labor committee started talking about wage theft. And as a result of the dangers of wage theft that really affects a person's ability to support their family, we are starting a workers' protection unit at the DA's office. In speaking with the business community, we discovered the real dangers of retail theft and the impact that it has, not just on the big retailers and the big box stores, but also the small businesses, the convenience stores, and the grocery mart. And so with that, we created our organized retail theft committee. And when we talked to our members from our Asian community, what we learned about were the hate crimes and hate incidents and the robberies along Stockton Boulevard. And so we started town hall meetings with the Sheriff's Department and our law enforcement partners. And what we did there was we then had our community prosecutors take a look at those cases and hold those individuals responsible. But we are doing more. We are doing more in terms of connecting with the community. What we started was an alternative sentencing program and I see here in the audience my good friend and community leader, Nicole Clavo. And the purpose of the Alternative Sentencing Council was to create a program where individuals who committed nonviolent offenses have an opportunity, an alternative opportunity, instead of incarceration. But we're going to expand that program this year, and what we're going to be doing is partnering with the building trades. And we're going to create a program that is called Changing Courses. And what I mean by that is if you are facing a crime that is nonviolent, instead of going the incarceration route, you have an opportunity to change the course of your life by entering into an apprenticeship program with a building trade. And if you complete that program and if you develop that skill and get a job, it will be an alternative for nonviolent offenders, an opportunity for them to change the course of their life so that they take their lives away from a life of crime to a life of construction. But we're going to be doing more in terms of connecting communities. In terms of connecting communities, we're going to make sure that all voices are heard, including the voices of victims. And so this year, in partnership with, our non, with a nonprofit, Justice Beyond the Courtroom, on April the 11th, we are going to be having the first ever Voices for Victims Summit on April 11th. Stay tuned for more details but we are doing more to connect with communities. Last year, what we did was with our partnership with Find Help, a company that connects people in need with the resources that we require, we partnered with them and created a domestic violence app. A domestic violence app that allows domestic violence victims to be able to find shelter, to be able to learn about restraining orders, to find out whether or not, for example, their abuser is still in custody. And this particular app that we have at Find Help, with Find Help, allows for such opportunities. But this year what we're doing is we are going to expand. January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And human trafficking is a spiraling crisis that we see on the streets affecting children and adults. And with that, we're going to um, partner with Find Help again to expand our app to include now resources for human trafficking victims so that they can find those resources and get the help they need. And so today, the last day of January, we are going to be announcing and demonstrating the expansion of our Get Help Sacramento app to include human trafficking. And with that, I'm going to show you a little video demonstrating what we are doing. Hi, I'm Sawan Vaden. I'm the Executive Director at Community Against Sexual Harm. 
I'm here to kind of walk through the Get Help Sacramento app with you to let you see how easy it is to use and how helpful it would be for the folks in our community. In 2022, CASH, along with RTI and ISR, completed a study that identified the scope of trafficking in Sacramento. And what we found was that between 2015 and 2020, 13,079 people had been identified by either service providers or law enforcement. There's an estimated 11.2 times more people that go unidentified that don't know about the resources and the possibility of escaping this life. And while CASH has tons of services, and along with some of the, our other partners that are here in the audience, like Weave, My Sister's House, our partner Family Justice Center, there are so many more things that are that are needed for this community. The DEA's office had previously had a uh, the app that mostly um, catered to DV survivors, and I am so excited that there is now this app, this resource available for trafficking survivors. As we look at the app, we type in our zip code. So let's see, for cash is 95817, search. And just like that, the hotline number comes up. So that's super cool. And then there's different sections of the app that help people see what's available closest to them. My sister's house, we've, if we go back and we're looking at personal safety, restraining orders, family justice center, Cal VCB, right? So that's super easy. And one thing I thought was really cool so if we go to human trafficking and look at the tattoo removal, which is something that people don't realize that this is a service that's available for them. Often tattoos leave um, this sign that this happened to them and they always have to look at it. All in all, I believe this is a fantastic app, super easy to navigate and exactly what we needed in our area. I am just excited for the things to come for Sacramento as we continue to combat trafficking. Thank you. And by, by the way, our um, star performer in that video is here today. Thank you so much. So it's not just about protecting people and connecting communities. It's also about preserving promises. You know, we've all seen the number one issue that our community faces. We are stuck between compassion and chaos. We've seen a 250% increase in our unhoused population. It's not compassionate for the unhoused or the housed. Against this backdrop earlier last year, I decided to take the unprecedented step of doing something about it. And when we talk about, and I'm going to digress for a moment. You know, I had never run for public office before, not for any office, not even class secretary. <laughs> and after becoming the district attorney for Sacramento County, I, I discovered several things really quickly. I discovered, number one, that the usual way of doing business usually leads to failure. I discovered that kicking the can down the road was easier than standing up and speaking up. I discovered that staying quiet was much easier because then you have nobody criticizing you, nobody writing op-eds, <laughs> nobody calling you the supreme dictator. Nobody telling you to stay in your own lane, even though your lane involves public safety. But what I also discovered was this, was that Sacramento was yearning 
for action, yearning for leadership. You know, I, not a day goes by where somebody doesn't stop me on the street, some random individual and say, thank you for doing what you're doing. And that tells me in terms of this informal poll that we are doing the right thing for the right reasons, that we are preserving our promises. And so in this room that we have here today, we have some amazing leaders that continue to preserve the promises and show leadership. You know, it starts with our Board of Supervisors, right, Patrick Kennedy and Sue Frost that are here. It starts with, frankly, the, the mayors and the, the city councils of the cities um, in our region, whether it be Elk Grove, whether it be Folsom, Citrus Heights, Rancho Cordova, Galt. And it also includes our state assembly member as well. You know, last year I partnered with uh, assembly member Kevin McCarty on AB 1360 which was a bill to create a soft lockdown facility for drug treatment. Because you see eight out of 10 individuals that are chronically homeless for more than a year suffer from mental health and drug addiction. And we created uh, essentially an avenue for people who commit certain crimes to go into that soft lockdown facility. And what we're working on this year is to create a model similar to Haven for Hope in San Antonio, except we're gonna have a Haven for Hope in Sacramento. And I, I'm hopeful that we will be able to establish that program this year. And when we talk about leadership, I also wanna recognize Sacramento City Council, Lisa Kaplan, who is seated up here next to me. <laughs> who has shown leadership in regarding revamping, along with our police chief, the protocols on enforcement in terms of the model of how that is done and the steps. That was a long, needed process, but we have much further to go. And what I will note is this. You know, we need to shake things up, to speak up, to stand up. We need to wake up Sacramento. We need to wake her up from her long slumber in which she tosses and turn from one fever nightmare to the next. And we just did that. We are awaking Sacramento and she is waking up. It's a slow process, but she is waking up. You know, later today it's gonna rain and it's probably gonna rain for about a good week. And I love the rain because the rain washes and it cleanses. But the rain also allows us a chance for rebirth. And so I have a hope. I have a hope that the sunrise is coming. I have a hope that the sun will shine its beautiful rays upon our beautiful community. I have a hope. Actually, it's more than a hope. And it's more than a faith. It's a determination with each and every one of you, that over this year, we will protect people, connect communities, and preserve our promises. Thank you.